you're supposed to have a attention statement at the beginning of every message you speak. One of the best ones is to stand there silent and look out at people and make them wonder what in the world is going on. And you get their attention then. At least most of the time, excluding those that have already gone to sleep. All people who are accountable to God for their actions in order for them to be in heaven must be people who are regenerated. They must be spiritually regenerated. Now why is that the case? Because all is sin and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3 and verse 23. And the wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23. When it says all has sinned, we must understand everybody that reaches the age of being accountable to God for their actions have transgressed God's law. For sin is the transgression of God's law. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. And that can only pay a person with death, that is, separation from God. And if there is no remedy, then when one dies, and it is appointed unto men once to die, and after that the judgment when the road is called up yonder. Hebrews 9.27. Then there's no hope. There is nothing but eternal damnation. For our God is a consuming fire. To whom? To those who have not been regenerated. To those who still stand with the terrible stain of sin upon them, standing unforgiven before God. Let's keep in mind that when we seek forgiveness, we seek God's forgiveness. For ultimately, all sins against God. It may involve some other people, and we need to deal with that as far as those people are concerned. But all sin is the transgression of God's law. 1 John 3, 4. And thus all sin is ultimately against God. He is the offended party. We are the offenders. There are three things that you and I must do. I having said that, I'll say, did you ever, did you ever hear anybody say, well, uh, I don't have to do anything. Well, that's just a big lie when they say that. They're just wrong. First of all, I already mentioned one thing. Every person must die. And uh, the confession of all humanity is found back over in the Old Testament. In 2 Samuel chapter 14 and verse 14. It just simply says in a simple sentence, we must needs die. Now, I've already cited Hebrews 9 and verse 27 that's appointed unto men once to die. Another one is every person must meet God. That's saint or sinner. And a saint simply is a member of the Lord's church, a child of God, a Christian. And the third thing is found in Romans 14, 12, and you can see how they all connect. Every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. I look around about me every day and I see people living relatively good lives. I don't know about what a lot of people are doing because what you see them doing during the day may not be what they're doing at night. Or behind closed doors, wherever they think they can be secreted from men to do whatever it is they do. But nothing's hidden from God. And every action that we take, good or bad, then man's going to have to give an account to God. He is our creator. He made the spirit within you. He put it in this body. He controls all things. He has a right to expect us to give an account of our deeds to him. 
If you and I don't wish to stand before God in a condemned condition, then we must be regenerated. We must be, as Jesus told Nicodemus, John 3, 3 and 5, we must be born again. Now let's look for a moment at the very necessity of regeneration. Righteousness is an indispensable condition placed between man, us, and our acceptance into fellowship with God. The greatest thing I can think of for a human being who's an adult and is accountable to God for his actions, knowing the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, is to seek fellowship with God, the one we've offended. To find that fellowship, to enjoy once again the fellowship that God wants all of his creatures to have. Well, it's only regeneration and a new birth that can produce that spiritual nature within us that makes it possible for us to be in fellowship with God. There is a change. It is ridiculous to say that here is a new creature in Christ as the Bible speaks of those who are new members of the church, new Christians, and then speak of the old man of the world. Well, something had to change. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot save ourselves even by great, what we consider to be from man's perspective, great works of righteousness. We must have the righteousness that is authored in heaven presented to us. It is the righteousness of the good news of Jesus Christ. You read 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, and you'll see Paul in writing to the church, those who have known that righteousness, those who are members of the church, reminding them how they became members of the spiritual body of Christ, thus reconciled to God thus regenerated. It would be good for us to then consider some things about that this morning because the doctrine of regeneration is so important and yet it's like so many other things when it falls into the hands of men it gets corrupted. Concerning our sinfulness of which we've been speaking and our need for righteousness here's what the inspired apostle Paul in the New Testament had to say. And, of course, he's writing to the church at Rome. Remember, they've heard the gospel. From the heart, they've obeyed it, Romans 6, 17, and 18. They are Christians, for the Lord's added them in their obedience to the gospel to his church. Here's what he had to say to them. But now, apart from the law, there is a righteousness of God. It's been manifested. What does manifest mean? It's been declared. It's been opened up. You can see it. You can read it. You can understand it. Then he goes ahead to say, even the righteousness of God hath been manifested. Well, is there any excuse then for us not to know it? It's in the teaching of the scriptures. Even the righteousness of God, now watch, through faith in Jesus Christ unto all them that believe. For there is no distinction for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Now you see the context of verse 23, Romans 3, 21 and 23. But here's what he also said. For we before laid to the charge both of Jews and Greeks that they're all under sin. Isn't that what he said in Romans 3, 23? All of sin and come short of the glory of God. Then he went ahead and added this. As it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. Romans 3, verses 9 through 11. I think it's important for us to understand that left to ourselves, 
Mankind has not sought God. Look at mankind in general before the flood. And since all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, man's interest has not been in knowing God's word and doing it all the time, all day long, every day. He's gone about doing other things. And sin encompasses all of us. There's no way that we can get around today without being around sinners. Question. Since sin is a transgression of the law, how do you get around your whole day and not be around somebody that's guilty of transgressing God's law? I don't think you can. Unless you live by yourself or with somebody else. Very few people, in other words, who are loving God and keeping His commandments. So by regeneration, a sinner becomes a child of God. That's an amazing thing. He is introduced into God's own family. 1 Timothy 3, 15, 15. Before regeneration, who are we? We're sons of the devil. We're separated from God. We're sons of disobedience. We're children of wrath. Let me say again, as I said off and on, everybody in this world is either a child of the devil or a child of God. And I assure you there's very, 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 very many other varies you want to put down. Few children of God in contrast to the children of the devil. And of course, as I said in the beginning, I speak of those who are accountable to God for their actions. We're not speaking of innocent people, such as infants and babies, small children who are not accountable to God for their actions. And of course, that even has to do with people who are in some way or another imbalanced. It's not their fault because their mind, their brain doesn't work right. They're unaccountable for their actions. I speak to those who are accountable to God for the things you choose to do. In Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, Paul addressed the church in Ephesus. Again, remember, they've heard the gospel. Like the Romans, like any other Christian, they've heard from the heart, obeyed the gospel. They've been added to the church for the Lord himself. And he said, and you did he make alive. When you were dead through your trespasses and sins, wherein you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that now worketh in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we once lived in the lust of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. This word nature here does not mean what many today teach, that we have inherited the actual sin Adam committed in the garden, just like we inherit the color of our eyes or our hair or whatever else. By nature there means through long action, generation after generation, it's just the thing that we do. It's not something that can't be changed. It's not something that comes through DNA. It's something we've gotten used to and it doesn't bother us. Today there's a generation that is not bothered by things in moral matters that 50, 60, 70 years ago would have bothered a lot of folks to do that. Now, why is that the case? Well, they've slipped away gradually. Things aren't that important anymore. I spoke to a young man a few weeks ago. Been trying to build a little bit of a relationship with him. He's in his early 20s. Very likable, amicable per person. As I've got to know him a little bit, he... I've invited him to come to worship. He didn't say much. He wasn't totally rejecting it, but he didn't say much about it. But in the process of visiting with him after that, 
He indicated he had a girlfriend. Well, that's not unusual. But then as we talked a little longer, they're living together. They're not married. They're living together. So I said to him, why don't you marry the girl? He kind of shrugged and said, well, I guess I could. I said, you know that's not right. Now, I knew when I said that, he may not know that's not right. I said, you know you're not married. He said, well, technically speaking, we're not. Now, think about that for a minute. No, technically speaking about it, you are not married. Matthew chapter 19, verse 6. God has not joined you together in marriage. You haven't intended to marry. You're living together in a state of fornication. My point is, that's just one instance from a guy that's a likable fellow. He's not somebody here robbing banks and all that kind of thing. And yet he has no compunction of conscience because of the way he's living. When I grew up, as long ago as that was, Brett, <laughs> people who might not darken the door of a church, many of them, not all of them, not all of them by any means, they would have been ashamed to admit they were living together. And in my class in school, I don't know there were five people that had divorced parents and married again, of course. There may have been two or three more. I don't know. We had 100. So what do you think about today? Well, people have degenerated, haven't they? It was bad enough just to sin, but it's, Worse when people go further and further into sin. And that's what we're speaking of. If the unregenerated person could be taken straight in their unregenerated state and placed in heaven to be a miserable person. A very miserable person. How do I know that? Take one of them and set them down in the assembly right now. When they love to gratify the lust of flesh, lust of eyes, pride of life, they've never been geared to anything religious. They're doing as they please. And put them in here. You say, well, I don't know about that. Well, invite them to come and see what happens. Do they show any interest? Invite them to have a Bible study. What happens? Do they show any interest? If they can't be interested in those things, what makes one think they would be interested in heaven? It wouldn't be. God has a process to prepare us to be ready for heaven. I wish we would understand that. And it's on this earth, loving God and keeping His commandments, that we prepare our characters, our inward man, to be in heaven. We don't, I think, understand that as we ought to. That person would have the would not have the spiritual and heavenly nature to enjoy the people, the marvelous provisions of heaven any more than they would right here. They wouldn't enjoy. We, we enjoy being together for faithful. And a whole lot of host folks wouldn't care to be around and discuss the things that we talk about. Wouldn't care to. They enjoy what they're doing. Is it possible for a person to love sin? Of course it is. And people do. All are destitute of the guiding spirit of God are yet living in the flesh and gratifying the appetites of the flesh. They cannot, if you please, see God or please Him. Paul, writing by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the church in Rome, stated emphatically, and they that are in the flesh cannot Please, God. Now, can you get any plainer than that? Well, I'm in the flesh, and you're in the flesh. So it can't mean just simply the Spirit's still re reunited with the body. It has to be something else. What's guiding your life? What do you seek? Well, you're either going to seek the ways of this world and the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, pride of life, 
those things are going to mean something to you. Or you're going to seek God and His righteousness. You're going to love the truth. If you ever watch people, they may be very brilliant and they're interested in this. Well, they could talk about this one thing of this present world all day long, every day, and just they're just so entwined in it. Try to talk to them about the Bible and watch them. <laughs> you ever ask yourself the question, why? Why can they have such a, a, a capable mind to be so investigatory in all sorts of things of this world and so willing to talk about it and they're interested and they're involved in it, but bring up the Bible? And they're another person. Well, we're just figuring out why. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. If your mind is set upon fleshly things, that's what's important to you. That's why Paul would say to the Corinthians concerning people who are powerful in this world, government officials and so forth, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Called how? By the gospel. It does not interest them. Well, the meaning of regeneration is important. Repentance certainly is involved. It's involved uh, in the sense to be born, reborn spiritually. The term occurs only twice in the scriptures. And even so, it is truly one of the most vital scriptural points that's revealed to us. In each case where the word regeneration is used, it signifies a new beginning or the act of a new birth. We've already mentioned that, John 3.3. 3. Paul wrote to the young preacher Titus in Titus 3.5, not by works of righteousness, which we did ourselves, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Titus 3 and verse 5. Now, there's one thing that stands out about this. He is talking about a new beginning. Or the act of rebirth. That's what got Nicodemus all balled up. He could not conceive of anything but a physical birth. The only other occurrence of the word regeneration is found in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 28. Scripture reads, And Jesus said unto them, Verily, which means it's the truth, I say unto you that ye who have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory, ye shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now this is in the Lord's earthly ministry. He's speaking of the work of the apostles of Christ as the ambassadors of the court of heaven. They were one chosen and officially given the responsibility of speaking the will of the King Christ to the earth that we have as the New Testament. First orally, and then they wrote it down along with those they laid hands on and gave the, God, uh, the uh, gift of prophecy, such as James and Mark. That's how we got the New Testament. God through Christ by the Holy Spirit through the inspired writers. That's why Paul could say, when you read what I wrote, you'll understand my knowledge and mystery of Christ. They were speaking as the Holy Spirit guided them. But notice if you followed him in the regeneration. That's during the Christian age. The last age which God will offer the hand of salvation to man. When this age ends, there's no more outstretched hand of salvation. It's simply the kind to come into judgment. Well, what does he mean when he says, Ye shall sit upon twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. What's well, through the apostles that the truth is revealed. That's the reason they're in the foundation of the church, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. That's why the early church, as we do today, if we're faithful, continues steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Acts 2.42. So there's a time, and I don't know when it's going to end. 
It's been going for about 2,000 years now. In which there's an opportunity to be regenerated. And here you see it's uh, referring to the time or period when this would take place. And when is that? While Christ is ruling from his throne. Now Peter declared in Acts 2, Christ was sitting and ruling at the right hand of God. Since that point till now and whenever the end of time comes is a period of regeneration. It's the opportunity to begin anew, to change your life, to turn from an old life of sin to a life of serving God. Regeneration is the free act of God's mercy and God's love and kindness whereby he causes the sinner to pass from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of Christ and out of death, separation from him into life, reconciliation to him and in fellowship with him by the process of regeneration. Now, none of this rules out the free will of man. You know, say Peter 3, 9, God would have all men saved. But all men must come to repentance. That's what we're talking about. All men must do what all men must do who are accountable to God and separated from God by their sins. The regeneration, the time, the period, this regeneration, ultimately results in the growth of righteousness and holiness in one's life. Thus, most of the New Testament is written to those who have been regenerated. They're new creatures in Christ. So they can grow from a babe in Christ to a mature person. Thus, the writer of Hebrews uh, scathingly takes on those Christians who become stunted. They have need again of being taught the first principles of the oracle of God because they haven't used the time properly. I wonder how many people are like that today. It's a place of growth and development. People say, well, I was baptized into Christ. Fine, you regenerated. You die as a baby. You can. I mean, you do. They never get beyond the infant stage. And thus, they draw back into perdition. They're lost. They apostatize. They go back to the ways of the world. They're separated from God again. But we're interested in those who want to grow up in Christ and become more knowledgeable of things and see this life for what it is, a place of getting ready for heaven. There is no other reason to look at this life any other way than to get ready for heaven. And now you can look at it any other way, but eternity's coming. And you don't know when you're going to step into it. You just don't. Man's inward man, his heart, as the Bible calls it, needs purifying and sanctifying. And thus, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. 1 John 1, 7. That's for the person that's steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as he knows, his labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. That's the faithful person. Good description there. Just those two verses. What is the means of regeneration? Well, it is a work of God. And there are a number of means or agencies involved in the process. John 1, 1 verse 3 or 13 says that we are born of the will of God. Well, we are. I read in verse 18 of the first chapter of James' epistle, of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth. We're reconciled by the death and resurrection of Christ. They're involved in this regeneration. Remember what is said by Jesus in John 3, 14 through 15? And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whosoever believeth may in him have eternal life. I want you to notice that. Whosoever believeth may, where does he have eternal life? May in him 
have eternal life. Ephesians 1, 3 says that all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ Jesus. Forgiveness of sins, regeneration would be one of them. And one must be baptized into Christ. Galatians 3, 27. Our new birth is conditioned on faith in Jesus Christ and all that pertains to. The scripture reads, as Peter wrote in 1 Peter 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy beget us again unto a living hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The resurrection of Christ with our regeneration. But the Holy Spirit himself, the third person of the Godhead, is a real and efficient agent in regeneration. He's called the spirit of life. That which is born of him is spirit and life. The spirit who through the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17, pricks our hearts, our inward man, our consciences, and he convicts us of sin. That is, he exposes our sin to ourselves. The Holy Spirit never regenerates an unwilling soul. Keep that in mind. The Holy Spirit never regenerates an unwilling soul. In John chapter 7, verse 17, you'll see why I say that. Jesus said, If any man willeth to do his will, he shall know the teaching, whether it is of God. I'm quite convinced after all these years of preaching and dealing with myself in the study of the Bible. If I'm not that interested in it, I'm not going to know it. That's true of anything else. Think about any particular thing, even in this life. If you're not interested in it, you're not going to pay much attention to it. And people geared to this world, according to the flesh, they don't pay any attention. I've seen people in gospel meetings and other places, they were there because they had to be there usually. Uh, I say had to be there. They always had a free choice not to come but to have peace at home for some reason. They showed up all the time, but they did everything they could to keep their mind off of the word of truth that was exposing the sin in their lives and proving to them they were lost. But think about other things. I talked to a man one time who had been living in adultery for years, and he came out of it. And I asked him, I said, well, how did you, because he was a member of the church when he was doing this, so how did you, knowing what the Bible said, live that way so long? He said, the time it crossed my mind, I'd dismiss it. i think about something else. I wouldn't think about what that meant when I died. And when I changed was when I started paying attention to it again and being interested in realizing where I was, what I had to do. Well, until you can reach that with a person, well, let's just put it this way. You can be in a mighty dry place a few weeks ago and not interested in all about the flood, but when the water's up around your neck, you get pretty well interested in it. And so we have to think about things like that. Sometimes we don't see how they bring us to think about them. A man must want to do the will of God. The evangelist or the preacher of the word is one of the means or agencies associated with regeneration in Christ Jesus Paul said I beget you through the gospel 1 Corinthians 4 15 then in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 21 it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe the idea is that the message is foolish to the person in the world the idea of saying in the Roman world that a person crucified would be your savior and would be God that's the idea the Word of God is absolutely essential to regeneration. The Apostle Peter, by inspiration, wrote, Having been begotten again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, through the Word of God. 1 Peter 1, 23. 
And Paul said that he might sanctify it, having cleansed it by the washing of water with the word. Ephesians 5, 26. Now, all of these means and agencies work together harmoniously in our regeneration or our new birth or making us Christians. You see, it's not such an in-depth theological investigation. To a great extent, it's a matter of being willing to take the Bible, the infallible, the inerrant, the all-sufficient, the final and complete revelation of God, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, and believe it because you've studied it and not try to run from it. There are a whole host of folks among all of those who just don't care. But a lot of folks will spend their time running from the truth. They do all they can to build up something. And they're all this world. You cannot expect people like that to understand the truth. It saves them. You cannot expect people like that to be regenerated. They have to want to. They have to be willing to submit to God. They have to hunger and thirst after righteousness. And remember, all of God's commandments are righteousness. Psalms 119, verse 172. It has to become your necessary food. Your soul's salvation has to take first place. My whole host of people over the years as I've preached have tried to serve God with reservations. It won't work. They'll give God so much, they're not going to give their all. They reserve some things to suit themselves. And that'll never work. It's all or nothing with Christ. But if we follow him, as he said, in the regeneration, we'll populate heaven. If you don't, you won't. It's a serious matter, isn't it? I don't know anything more serious. So if you're not a child of God, then you're not regenerated. You're still in your sins. You're still separated from God. You're cut off, and you're headed straight for a devil's hell when you die. And you don't know when that's going to happen. As a child of God, you have the hope of heaven. That doesn't mean the wish, I hope I can get there, but I don't know. It means I'm going to heaven. Now, if in your mind you can't say, I am going to heaven, you need to do some <laughs> correcting things. I don't know about you, but that's the only place I want to go and the only place I'm headed. And I've tried all my life to say, I'm going to heaven. You can, you can go wherever you want to go, but I'm going to heaven. I don't want to go anywhere else ultimately. Finally, and that's all that matters. Do you? Where else are you going? Where are you going with your life right now? If it's not to heaven, then you need to change your thinking and your outlook and your perspective and what your life's all about and the purpose of life. And the fact that someday you must stand before Jesus Christ to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. And if you're not regenerated, as we've discussed this morning from God's Word, You'll stand before him and here depart from me, ye that work iniquity, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Christ doesn't want to have to say that to anybody. You realize that? He does not want to have to say that to anybody. But we make the choice. Christ is not going to send a person to hell who's prepared for heaven. Not going to do it. He will send all to hell who choose to go there. God is cast a vote for you. The devil is cast a vote against you. Who holds the deciding vote? Each person. And Christ says to you, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest in your soul. If you're not a child of God, we urge you to believe in Christ, repent of your sins, and be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, and be regenerated, Lord, adding you to His church, and therein to grow and be a faithful Christian until you can hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. Do you realize on that day, and then the lesson's yours, you'll have families. Some will be regenerated and faithful unto death, and they'll go to the right hand in the glory. Come, you blessed of my Father, 
Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. But there will be some of that family who will say, Depart, ye that work iniquity. They'll never see one another again. Never, never, never. I talked to a lady who was dying of cancer many years ago. She had a son who was not at all interested in the truth. And she called him and she said, I told him, said, now when I die, we'll never see one another again. People want to terminate things here or extend them as we view things in the flesh. But there's a great day coming. A day of judgment, a day of separation. If we follow Christ in the regeneration, heaven will be our home. Are you subject to the invitation of our Lord? If so, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.